welcome to History Nuts. I'm Russ Carson Jr., the founder of Family Tree Nuts. At Family Tree Nuts, we build family trees for people and we produce videos at historic locations and videos that help to honor your ancestors. I'm Jameson Cable, founder of the Kentucky History Podcast, where we talk about anything Kentucky history, events, people, if it has to do with Kentucky, we're going to discuss it. And we've teamed up together to bring you History Nuts. History Nuts is a live show where we talk about, you guessed it, history. Right. History seems to be less and less to people today, but we are trying to do everything we can to keep it alive. Absolutely. History is a passion of ours for sure, but it connects to you. Russ, tell us about the best part of the show. You can join in. You can comment and ask questions live. We've got a great topic today, and we know you're going to enjoy this episode of History Nuts. What's up, man? We are live. We are live. How's it going? That's going spectacular. Are, are you ready to knock one? Are you ready to knock one out of the park? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was the guy that was the uh, the pinch pinch runner. You know, they put the uh, the big kid in that plays first base, oh. and then I'd steal all the way around. But uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you just fast, uh, fast. That's good. That's right. Yeah. How about yourself? I would have definitely been been the speed guy as well. I was not. <laughs> I was not knocking it out of the infield. <laughs> Second base. Yeah, yeah. Second yeah. base. Second base. Yep. I, I, I totally guessed that. I looked at that. <laughs> you know, I know you're about five foot two. You know, oh, well, well, give or take. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man. Hey, we got a great show tonight. I'm surprised that we haven't done this one before. Yep. Uh, definitely a huge connection to Kentucky. And I mean, it, it's the season, right? Baseball season is going on. It, it's the yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, a, a Kentucky connection for sure that mm -hmm. we've got here. The uh, Louisville Slugger. Uh, I asked uh, Jordan earlier. I said, "Do I look like Negan sitting here holding my bat?" You know, who Negan is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who? Negan <laughs> from The Walking Dead. But that's another TV show. But, uh, oh, okay, okay. I thought you were trying. I thought you were talking about maybe a baseball player or something. I was like, uh, I don't know. Right. Uh, don't know. <laughs> right. So, so our show tonight is about Pete Browning. The the Louisville Slugger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, well, let me. Add, I mean, how big of a baseball fan are you? I mean, you, 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 big baseball fan. Well, man, I was a kid of the '80s. You know, we didn't have fifty thousand television stations, so what we had was our was our Cincinnati Reds. You know, on, <laughs> on Fox every, every night. You know, kind of things. But uh, be quite honest, I haven't watched a whole lot of baseball in the last couple of years. Right, but well, so yeah. so. But you, you were when Sabo and Larkin and uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they were all yeah. You know, yeah, I remember those times. Was, yeah, that, that was I was a bit era. I was a bit <laughs> young, young, but uh, uh, yeah, man, absolutely. I, um, I, I'll tell you this: this is my my baseball uh, a story. I, I really liked baseball when I was younger, and then they went on strike. And you know, we we y'all you know, played in the you know little league, and we had the hats, but then they went on strike, and we couldn't wear the hats that with the logos on them and all that stuff uh and i was like i'm done i can't handle this no more <laughs> and i hung up i hung up my cleats for baseball hung it up hung, all right that's the bright young age of now maybe 10 yeah <laughs> <laughs> well good deal so this is something it's uh we're not just this isn't a sports show <laughs> you know kind no, of no no turned into one real easily but uh, as a matter of fact, I think that's the first time I've ever seen you not in a Kentucky Wildcats t-shirt. But uh, oh, oh, well, yeah, that's probably <laughs> <laughs> we, we could talk about sports all day long. But this is actually a historical story, uh, yes. one that touches little boys and uh, grown men and even women, you know, in softball today, everywhere, mm -hmm. millions yeah. of people. And they, they know the name Louisville Slugger, but they don't know the history behind it, where it came where from. It from. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, Got kind of almost a hundred and fifty year old uh, uh, story too. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. So, so Lewis Rogers, Pete Browning. That's the that's where we're starting at, I guess. Right? I mean, that's where uh, we want yes, to. So, so his name's Lewis Rogers Browning. 
but he mm -hmm. went by Pete. I mean, why not? You know? Yeah, I wanted to throw a name in there, Pete. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting thing. You know, it's funny how you get nicknames there. So they yeah, called him yeah. Pete. Yeah, Pete. So uh, when was he born? Oh, where, 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 oh, what time oh, period are we oh. talking about? Yeah. So, uh, well, before we even get that, you know, uh, give us some comments where you where you um, where you listening from. Maybe uh, what's your favorite baseball team? Tell us your yeah. favorite baseball team. I like the Reds. I guess that's my favorite. <laughs> They're the closest ones. Uh, <laughs> there's a uh, you know the Lexington Legends, the Louisville Bats. Um, there's a team in Northern Kentucky too, but I don't know what their name their name is right off. Uh, they were the, the Glory or the they, they, yeah that's a yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I don't know. Anyway, baseball. I don't keep up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so, and also, tell us if you used a Louisville Slugger. I'm sure if you played yeah. played baseball, you'd probably definitely definitely used one at one point. Um, but anyway, as you said, he went by Pete 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 Browning, uh, and he was actually born in Louisville in 1861 too. Hometown boy. Yeah, hometown. Uh, his father was a grocer. A grocer? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, he was uh, killed by a tornado when he was the only when when Pete was only thirteen. Uh, yeah, isn't that wild? Yeah, I, yeah. I think we talked about that tornado once, didn't we? Uh, well, yeah. Our, doing the math, that tornado would have been in uh, 74, 1874. Yeah. Uh, the big the big Louisville tornado wasn't until um, eighteen ninety. Okay. Uh, it like was like massive, uh, you know, took out a lot of people, killed like two hundred, injured like four hundred, or I don't know, you know, my numbers might be off there, but big injury or big tornado that was in um, eighteen ninety. But anyway, so his dad got killed when he was thirteen. Pretty, pretty tragic, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, he continued living with his mom. This is pretty unique. His whole life uh, in the house that he grew up in. So pretty, pretty neat little uh, tidbit. You know, he. Uh, did not um, um, leave home. So. Yeah, and we had a comment pop up there. Old Irish Reb says, "Was he a pro or minor?" He definitely, we'll pro. <laughs> yeah, definitely pro. Yeah, definitely pro. Really, really and, good pro. <laughs> and I, I don't know. You know, I don't know the. Um, you know, I don't know the history of baseball. I don't know if there was a minor league even at this time, or if it was all just leagues everywhere you know you had the national league and the american league but you had more than one league so i don't know yeah, i don't know how that falls that's teams. a good question that I, I just don't know um yeah absolutely so uh um so he lived with his mom but uh he played baseball when did he start playing uh professional baseball from 1882 to 1894 so wow. yeah pretty good career about 12 years there uh played oh, for nine, nine years before i played t-ball well he ended a hundred years before <laughs> before i retired <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right on the nose <laughs> yeah, those uh, little little uh, things go but yeah. he played from 1882 to what what do you say 1894 94 so yeah. uh, had a 12 year career yeah played played for many different teams um uh and again professional leagues um, the Louisville Eclipses, which was the Louisville team. The Eclipse. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, what a name! Uh, where were you? Where do they get that name from? Like, yeah. I, I mean, you know, typically you get a mascot, and you kind of tie it to your your, you know, place in some sort of way. But the Eclipses, uh, I just don't. I, just, I don't see the tie to Louisville at all. Um, but the Louisville Colonels, though. Yeah, that yeah. one makes sense. That makes a bit more sense. <laughs> Um, uh, the Cleveland Infants, the Cleveland Infants, what infants? Like, <laughs> I think of like, one of the stupidest names I've ever heard. <laughs> I you think know? so too. I was thinking, man, that's um, that's a baby, right? Or is that yeah. more like infantry? You think it might be for infantry, though? I don't know, man. They they they, they had some silly names. There's a lot. Of, if you go to YouTube, uh, you can see a lot. You can look up a lot of these videos of crazy yeah. uh, historic names that were out there in professional sports. Speaking of YouTube, make sure if you like these videos, uh, you make sure you subscribe to uh, Family yeah. Tree Nuts and the Kentucky History Podcast there. Uh, mm -hmm. where we've got videos almost on a daily basis that are hitting them, you know, history yep. videos. Uh, so here's another weird one. Pittsburgh Alleghenies. Yeah. 
I mean, the Alleghenies. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I mean, mountain, I guess it, it makes sense. The mountains, yes, and but the river, the river Allegheny, the Monongahela, you know, yeah. together there. So. But you, you know, the Pittsburgh Alleghenies do become the Pirates. Yeah. Uh, over time, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, which become the Reds. The Red Stockings. And, yeah. Uh, First baseball team. That's right. That's right. That's why. That's why they're so good now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Usually out by the All Star break, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, somebody posted it. Bisbee bees. <laughs> the Bisbee bees. Okay, that was not too bad. Uh, St. Louis Browns, which became the Cardinals. The St. Louis Browns. Yeah, that doesn't okay. just say, you know. I just want to say Cleveland Browns so much, so badly, and the St. Louis Cardinals, right? You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Brooklyn. Bride, bride grooms. Okay, that's worse than infants, man. That is the worst. I mean. Brooklyn, there ain't nothing scary about a bridegroom at all. <laughs> he might be scared, you know. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> the, the bride grooms. What yeah. a horrible name! But uh, that's who he played for. Yeah, and they, which became the Dodgers. The Dodgers. So uh, pretty interesting. Uh, he was known for his uh, incredible hitting skills, and sure. he never. Never batted under 300. Yeah. Which is, which, you know, that's the batting average, correct? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Basically, three out of every 10 times at bat, he gets a hit. Yeah. Yeah. Not a walk or a strikeout or a put out. He gets a hit. That's a heck yeah. of a. Heck, if you know anything about baseball, you know about batting yeah. average. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, his lifetime average is uh, uh, 341, which is. Pretty good. It, it's the ranks fifth in history for for a right-handed. You know, right-handed, left-handed. Sure. Uh, there, there's a difference there. Uh, interesting. In, interesting on my baseball skills. Bat bat left-handed, but throw and catch right-handed. Okay. So, Make it a little quicker. Make it a little quicker. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so he he's. he's He's one of the all-time greatest, right? I mean, he's, he ranks up there in the top ten or so, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, however, he's not in the Hall of Fame, which is, you know, kind of like what, what – I don't know what the holdup here is. I mean, his his name, Louisville Slugger here, which we're going to get to, is known throughout baseball. And yet he, he's – even and he was a good player. It's not like he was bad. Uh, yeah. But he is not um, – uh, he's not in the Hall of Fame. I think he's one of only – there's only one other guy in the top ten in batting. Uh, Joe Joe Jackson. Jackson. Oh shoot, Joe Jackson. Joe Jackson. You know who that is, don't you? Mm -hmm. Oh no! Oh no! Say it ain't, say it ain't so. I, I want to think. Of, I want to say Bo Jackson, but I know it's not Bo Jackson. It was Joe. You know the the guy the the Black Sox. Have you seen uh, Field of Dreams? Some guys say. Oh Frank okay Frank. okay. It was right. Joe Jackson. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's him and him him and Pete Browning are the only uh, ones in the top ten. Batting average just no, not in the I mean, come on, people. What do you, what do you get, get them in there? Um, I guess we need to write our letters, though, and let them know. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, he was the first person to have bats or a bat, you know, made suspe uh, specifically for him. And that's when we get, that's where we're getting to here with the whole Louisville slugger, um, how it even came about. Um, right. So in 1884, a 17-year-old boy uh, named Bud Hillerich. Hillerich. Yep. Hillerich. Yep. Hillerich. Hillerich. I've always heard Hillerich. of him. Hillerich. Yep. He uh, skipped out on his work. Uh, he went to a baseball game and uh, he yeah, saw. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, speaking of skipping, <laughs> um, my uh, senior skip day, uh, we skipped school and went to a Reds game. Uh, but <laughs> the funny thing is. Uh, the Reds game was at like seven o'clock at night. Oh, and, uh, you know, we could have easily went to school and uh, made the game, but uh -huh. <laughs> you know, we left early and you know, check check that's out. Pretty, that's pretty daring, I guess, wasn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we were so re rebellious. Um, but anyway, so yeah. uh, oh, Jason Rensel says twenty two years ago he went to uh, visited there when he was at the FFA uh, national convention. Oh, oh, cool! There it is right there. <laughs> so, but, uh, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, oh, oh, Bud is at this baseball game, and Pete has been on a bit of a slump. Uh, 
he's known as the Louisville slugger being from Louisville and uh, being a pretty good batter. Um, but it's, but you know, he's in a, a big slump and uh, he, uh, Bud offers him, offers to make him a new bat in his dad's yeah. wood, wood, wood working shop. And I guess Pete's just like, sure, man. Yeah. Sounds great. I could, <laughs> I'll try anything at this point. Sure. Uh, the, <laughs> the next day uh, Pete uses this bat and he breaks out of his slump. He gets three hits. You know, he, he, he's pumped up this magic bat. The slugger has is, is found his bat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so then, so then everyone wants his, want, wanted one of these bats. And uh, that's how the Louisville slugger was born. Um, well, I would imagine so. I mean, somebody with a high profile like that. I mean, you know, baseball was king for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, some people, it's America's pastime. Mm -hmm. Um, people would argue its popularity today, but, you know, for a very, very, very long time, it's all you had. And these people, especially in the, you know, early, the late 1800s, early 1900s were mega, 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 mega stars. Yeah. Uh, even no, even more than our sports heroes are today. So newspapers would carry these stories all over the place. And he's in a slump and a local boy, a local boy goes to his dad's <laughs> parking shop and fashions him out of bat. Yeah. Brings it in there, and he goes three for three, starts – crushes his slump. And if you know much about baseball, they're pretty superstitious. You know? Yes. You know, that is very rally caps and all that stuff. Uh -huh. you know? mm -hmm. There's all kinds of superstitions that go into baseball. So the name is born. The name Louisville born. Slugger, everybody wants one. Forget making furniture. They started making bats. Bat. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're going to get that to here, get to that um, here in a second. Um, but um, with, old, with old Pete, I mean, he had a good uh, career, you know, very good average, which I guess, you know, my, my, my thought here is maybe he only played for 12 years, which I, that's still a pretty long career. I mean, I don't know of too many baseball players who have careers longer that are, you know, very successful. Um, but maybe that's re one reason why he's not in the Hall of Fame. He just didn't play as long. Or he played 100 years ago. So I don't know. But anyway, he, he kind of also suffered from some uh, medical conditions that uh, left him deaf and uh, had a lot of headaches. Um, so that then, of course, led him to drinking. Um, uh, he you know, started he hit, drinking when he was, what, about 30? Uh, no, no, he was a kid. He started, started throwing back the booze when he was young. Uh, <laughs> That's how he self-medicated. I got, he yeah. got, got headaches and things and uh, yeah. kicked back the, uh, the whiskey. Uh, yeah, uh, get us some comments there. Uh, Vanessa says never fall, followed baseball much, but uh, know some of the names. Just found out that Bill Vierden was married to my cousin. Love hearing all this. Thanks, guys. So that's pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, yep. man. A lot of people have connections to a, a certain ball player. Uh, old Irish Reb said his uncle made a living pitching for the minors. Left oh. in the 20s and 30s. Pretty yeah. cool. That's a pretty cool nickname. Yeah, man. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, he started drinking when he was a kid. Um, he was suspended several times <laughs> for drunkenness on the field. Maybe that's why he's not in the Hall of Fame. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's kind of my thinking of it. But, you know. Yeah. Well, my my thought is, you know, I've seen some baseball players do some worse, get caught with worse, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> never, right. uh, it never affected his heat heating skills though. He was always able to uh, no you know, knock him out. He's got a famous quote. <laughs> the famous, famous yeah. quote that he used to say: "If I if I can't hit the ball, oh, I can't hit the ball until I hit the bottle. <laughs> I can't hit the ball until I hit the bottle. <laughs> Interesting, you know. Very there's much. a lot of times people I can't see straight unless I'm drunk. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> that is a huge sign of alcoholism. <laughs> yes. For sure, yeah. yeah. When people cannot function, right? And I'm not making light of alcoholism. It is a mm. definite real." real disease and sickness for sure. But uh, uh, interesting fact that uh, he was had a reputation kind yep. of thing. So like so many famous people of today, even, you know, uh, they find solace in a bottle, but I think his drinking was really more due to his, uh, his sicknesses that he had yeah. you know, you know, he, from, from being a kid, he, you know, we don't, he probably had something real simple that could have been fixed, you know, when yeah. he was, in today's world, but, uh, uh, you know, drove him to the bottle as a young man. 
Yep, yep. So um, he he it said that he was always uh, was full of quirks, quirks. You know, gave gave bats bib- biblical names, which would be cool. I would like to know some of those. Uh, yeah, names. Jethro. You know, Bosey. <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but uh, and he, he would. Re- bats. Yeah, and he would retire them too. He would retire them, I guess, after probably whenever they went on. He, if he ever went on a slump. <laughs> He'd probably change his bat, bat but it's time to retire it. Now, nowadays, they you know they only use a couple of bats. A lot of times, they'll use three or so in a, in a game. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. That's true. But he would uh, stare at the sun sometimes, and uh, uh, you know, for whatever reason, to make him uh, tough. To make him tough, <laughs> stare at the sun, kind of thing. <laughs> it sounds to me like a sissy test. You know, where you take the eraser and ah, uh, yeah. Say, How long can you take this pain? Stare at the sun. <laughs> So he would stick his head out of the window of trains. Yeah. So, so cind- cedars would, uh, you know, cleanse his eyes. Yeah. So the cinders would clear out his eyes, right? Clear out his sinuses. <laughs> what in yeah. the heck? This guy had some. Like we. I don't know, man. <laughs> we've covered some. We've covered some people, but I mean, you know, oopsie. Maybe, uh, maybe, uh, not. Maybe uh, uh, the most unusual one I'm thinking of is. Um, uh, King Solomon. That's the only one I can think of that might be <laughs> as uh, quirky and um, unusual. Right. Right. Yeah. So. We're two for two for people that uh, actually three for three for, uh, we've talked about of people that didn't come from uh, gen- from the uh, landed gentry that uh, alcohol has a lot to do with. <laughs> yeah. Lives, so yeah. yeah. Well. so uh, he does eventually retire. And after he retires, um, he becomes a cigar salesman. And he owned a bar. So. I mean, what, what would any guy? Well, want to well. <laughs> you know, that was like a decent retail sells cigars and uh, opens up a, a bar. So yeah, yeah. Um, his his health though, his health gets so bad that he uh, uh, was committed uh, to an insane asylum in 1905, uh, which yeah. I mean is only 11 years after he quit playing baseball. You know, that's not too yeah. long. Um, and, well, um, we- We've talked about that. Remember the story we did on Eastern State Hospital, you know, a lot of times when they did not know how to deal with people, you know, they would send them to the, the mental hospitals. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Today, they could have just taken some sort of medication and, and been OK, you know. Yep. Uh, not, not the case. Not the case there. Uh, so his, his sister had him released uh, two weeks later. Uh, but but was then he was in hospitalized a month after that. So he was only in the asylum for two weeks, but then he went to the hospital a month uh, later. Lived and a then, old age, didn't he? Yeah. Then yeah, forty four. Died at forty four. Uh, various issues, including cancer, uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Really not. You know that one was a give me, I guess, uh, and and some alcohol related brain damage. So alcohol related brain damage. Yeah, I mean, you can only imagine how much the guy was drinking. I mean, he stared at the sun and stuck his head out to the, <laughs> the cinders. So, uh, uh, and he couldn't yeah. hit the ball. He couldn't hit the ball straight until he hit the bottle. Yeah. So, if, I mean, I don't know how many games they played, but I mean, if he's playing day after day, he's drinking every day. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Well, um, interesting character for sure. But yes. and, and and you know, a nickname of something that uh, we all know. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised to find an American that's never heard the word Louisville Slugger. Yep, yep. Um, Louisville Slugger. That's how you yeah. say it, isn't it? Louisville, Louisville Slugger. Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> Louis Slugger. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back to talk about the other side of this story. Okay. That yes, good. Yeah. We take you to Kentucky's past in the 1880s. Kentucky was still in a recovery from the Civil War. Divisions and tensions still lingered and loyalties were strong. Renegades and mobs sought vigilante justice. But our story focuses on Ashland. Ashland, Kentucky in the 1880s had a population of 3,280. It was a peaceful, thriving city on the banks of the Ohio River, producing ironworks and using the river for transportation. It set the scene for a beautiful town. 
the community was happy, connected, and little concern was given to crime and violence. But our story begins on Christmas Eve in 1881. The Gibbons family lived on Geiger's Edition in the eastern part of Ashland. There was Martha, who was married to John Gibbons. Their children that lived in the house were Robert, 17, Fanny, 14, and Sterling, 11. This family knew heartaches. When Robert was seven, he lost his leg in a rail car accident. One year prior, they had lost a sibling and a son, Harry. And to add to all this, John Gibbons often left the family for extended periods of time. At this time of our story, John had been gone for a time. With his father gone, Robert stepped up and provided for his family and worked at the Norton Iron Works. He was a well-respected young man in the community. On Friday, December 23rd, Martha and Sterling planned to go to Ironton, Ohio, to visit Martha's older married daughter. She had asked the neighbor, Caroline Thomas, if her daughter, Emma Carrico, could stay the night with Fanny. This part of the day went as planned. Martha heads north. At 6 p.m., Emma kissed her mother goodbye and headed to the Gibbons' place and stayed with Fanny. Then Robert came home after work around 8.30. Christmas Eve would arrive the next day. At 4.30 a.m., Miss Thomas woke to stoke the fire. She saw a lamp burning in the Gibbons house and thought it was a bit early for the kids to be up. So she stepped outside to get a better look. And when she was on the porch, she saw that it wasn't a lamp but it was flames coming out of the window. She ran to the house screaming, fire! When she got there, she couldn't get in the front door, so she moved to the side door, which was unlocked. All this time, she was yelling, Emma, Emma, Robert, Fanny, Emma. There was no response. She opened the side door, but was forced back by the waves of smoke. With all the commotion, the neighbors began to wake. They ran to assist in any way. Joseph Arthur was the first to arrive. And as more neighbors showed up, one shouted, grab the buckets, form a line. They formed a bucket brigade to fight the fire, passing water to each other, trying to abate the fire as quickly as possible. Caroline was frantic. A neighbor, George Faulkner, tried to understand her panic. She told him, Emma, Emma, she's in there. The Gibbons kids are in there. Upon this realization, Faulkner rushed to the house. He first broke a window to try and see if Robbie was there but he couldn't feel him inside. He then went to another window, broke it out with an ax, and he could see one of the girls on the floor. Faulkner was sickened by what he saw. J.W. House came to help and reached into the house and was able to pull Emma's body out. He went in next, and among the smoke, he was able to find Fanny Gibbons' body on the bed covered in burning clothes. He carried her out the side window. Fighting his exhaustion, he got his breath, and House rushed back in to fight the flames and smoke again. He searched in panic and found Robbie's body and was able to drag him to the porch, out of the house. A large group had formed and was now battling the fire. Another panic rose again for young Sterling, but by the time they realized he wasn't there, the fire had caught such a blaze they couldn't get in, even if they wanted to. The sun began to rise in the east, and the horror of the scene lay before the eyes of the people of Ashland. It seemed the whole town had gathered to see the heartbreaking scene. Caroline Thomas could not be comforted. People were sickened by what they saw, and those who helped were exhausted. It is always a tragedy when innocent children die. The families mourn, the friends mourn, and the entire community mourns. As the light grew on the morning, Realizations and whispers began to grow like the flames of the fire. Whispers of arson, whispers of murder. This is only the beginning of the Ashland tragedy. The information for this video was gathered from Joe Castle's book, The Ashland Tragedy, which you can buy in the links in the description. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification button for the latest content from the Kentucky History Channel.
visit our website for even more Kentucky history. Hit the links in the description to follow us and listen to the Kentucky History Podcast. Support the channel at patreon.com slash kyhistorypod or paypal.me slash kentuckyhistory. A special thanks to our patrons, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Whoa! What? What? (laughs) (laughs) I've seen that one before, you know, but uh, (laughs) man, what a horrific story. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is a pretty wild story, and it gets even crazier. Like that's not even like the beginning of it. I mean, well, I mean that is the beginning of it, I guess. But it's a wild story, and uh, you know, if you if you like history books or anything like that, I would definitely recommend reading uh, Joe Castle's book. Uh, we'll talk about it here on this show, you know, here soon um, as well. Um, I, I, I've been making a few videos too about the whole incident. Going to be on the podcast. I mean, it's all. Uh, very good, very well covered. That's a different style in videos that you've done there, like a narrative there instead of, uh, yeah, you know, just uh, fact, fact, fact kind of thing. Fact, yeah, spitting facts, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, like subscribe to the channel, you'll see, see when the next one comes out or and that one too. Um, yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. But let's go to the other side of the story as far as the Louisville Slugger. We know about old Browning, he's the one hitting them. Uh, but uh, the, the other side is the people who are making them. Um, and it all kind of begins with the, the Hillrich family. Um, yeah. So uh, they yeah. actually, and, and this is interesting too, because they actually, um, in 1842, uh, J. Frederick Hillrich, uh, he immigrated um, with his family from Germany to Baltimore, Maryland. And they moved to Louisville, in 1856, which is interesting, uh-huh. because what happened the year before? Bloody Monday. Bloody Monday. So it's very interesting that they still the came. The and Irish against the Wasps. Uh-huh. Yeah. So um, see how anyway, the, this is an individual story of how it ties into yeah, yeah, this bigger story. Yeah. So he he started the woodworking shop, and um, uh, by 1864. Um, Frederick, which is or, or J. Frederick, um, or Fred, they called him Fred. Um, uh, he, he was a uh, he, his business was being uh, was growing quite well. Um, he, he had many orders being filled, you know, he was doing this and that. Uh, but then, of course, his eldest son, which was John Andrew Bud Hillrich, uh, was born in Louisville in 1866. Um, but he, he made a lot of stuff, you know, furniture, stuff for steamboats. Uh, they were making a lot of woodwork and stuff. Um, uh, but it was thriving. And by 1775, the um, uh, woodwork shop. I, yeah. Well, do what? 1875, yeah. Yes, 1875, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, his business was pretty good. He employed about 20 people. Um, and in 1880, Bud became an apprentice. Uh, for his father, and he really liked baseball, and that's kind of where it, it comes into play. He was he was working at his father's business, and he took the day off. Um, and, and he also played amateur. He played amateur baseball as well. He he would make bats for his teammates and so forth. Um, but he um, skipped skipped work, uh, went to a game, and he uh, he uh, met uh, 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 Pete Browning. And um, he was like, hey, man, I'll make you a bat. Brown was like, let's go for it, man. Isn't uh, it interesting stories that uh, come about by people doing something they weren't supposed to be doing? Uh, yeah. They yeah. weren't in school or they weren't where yeah. they were. Or, you know, yeah, just, kind of thing. And had he not done that that day, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. What if, what if uh, Pete Browning broke his streak, you know, while he was at work? Just something yeah. insignificant. And uh, he never got the idea to make a bat. Mm-hmm. Getting out of his slot there, yeah. So, and it's funny. So he saw Pete like Pete broke his bat, bad. I guess you know because he was having a bad day or whatever. And um, he, he said, "Hey, come to my wood shop and we'll make you a bat." And therefore, they he made him a bat. And um, that's kind of the end of the story. However, there's a bit more. His dad did not like baseball. And his dad did not want any part of it. He didn't want any of the production to be about baseball or uh, be baseball bats or anything. Um, but eventually, he, he kind of gave in, 
And uh, he didn't really think there was money in baseball bats, but obviously he was wrong. And um, they started shipping them all over the country. <laughs> they oh, made a lot of money from crazy. baseball bats. <laughs> right. Everybody um, wants to use what the pros are using, you know, and all the way yeah. to, and this was the beginning of all that, you know, I mean, yeah. What, yes. Like, my, like Jordan's, you know, wearing yeah. Jordan, yeah. Jordan's shoes, you know, or, and, and uh, all kinds of other things that are endorsed by mm -hmm. sports celebrities. This was the first. Yeah, and he, he he got patents. He got some patents. Or oh, Fred, uh, the, the boy, or uh, no, not Fred. Fred's the father. Bud, the boy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he um, he got some patents, um, and um, you know, sorry, he he took over the business in like eighteen ninety seven. I think uh, he trade he trademarked the Louisville Slugger uh, um, name, and um, it's history from there, or at least. That's part of that history. Absolutely. Uh, Definitely history for sure. So it's really cool stuff. I mean, it's a name that we're all familiar with. And uh, I'd be willing to say that, my gosh, half of all Americans have held in their hands at one time, mm -hmm. you know, you know, now, boy or girl kind of thing. I got, I got some, I got some really cool stat or facts here. Um, and I got this from the Louisville Slugger history or museum website. They have them all there. You can go there and look, go visit, <laughs> do what? Have you been there? I have not. I've been to, you know, I've, I've been to Louisville plenty of times, but I've been to the Muhammad Ali one, but I've not been to the Louisville Slugger one. Have you? Yeah, we're seeing. Oh, yeah, many times. Pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So there is 22 steps in making a Louisville Slugger bat, which is pretty cool. Um, Ty Cobbs, his career batting average, uh, which is the highest in Major League history, was point, or was 366. Uh, which he used a little slugger. Uh, Babe Ruth, when he, um, you know, his Louisville slugger was 50 ounces. Wow. Uh, and, uh, yeah. That's, 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 yeah, it's a monster. <laughs> you probably use, what, an 18? Yeah, that'd be best, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted me to get it across the plate. <laughs> yeah, the 28s, the 30s, 32s. <laughs> Um, yeah, eighty percent, eighty percent of the hitters in the National Baseball Hall of Fa Hall of Fame had Louisville Slugger contracts. So that is pretty dominant. Uh, wow. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that's just about. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. A uh, five thousand. Uh, the peak output capacity for the capacity for the factory is usually reached during spring training each year, and that it, they make five thousand bats. Wow! Yes, um, they make a hundred. Let's see. Um, ordered by ordered by this is ordered by pro players. A hundred to hundred and twenty are ordered by pro players. Um, wow! The the largest bat in the world. Is at the Louisville Museum or Louisville Slugger Museum, and it is 120 feet tall and 68,000 pounds. Yeah, it's right out front. Ooh. You can get a picture taken, and it's kind of hard to get your photo with that big, huge bat right there that's out front. And I, I'll ask you this question: How many, um, how many bats do you think are made in the H and B factory a year? Eight hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, one point eight million. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. A million off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, um, now it's I don't know what all over the world, all over the world. This, you know, oh yeah. Do, so. Yeah. So I don't know what a billet is. Maybe somebody does, but the number yeah, of I billets. I do. What is what is a billet? They're like the nubs, you know, that that on, on the end of the bat. Okay. They, okay. They on there, and they. You know, they twirl the bat, you know, to shape it and things like that. And then they shave off those billets and you can, they'll give them to you free if you go on the tour. Okay. So this is the number of billets included in each batch that's shipped to the factory, five to 8,000. So that's a lot, I guess. <laughs> okay. I might be thinking of something else. I might be not, maybe I'm thinking the wrong thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I don't. I, you know. Again, I don't know much about uh, bat making, but there you have it. So yeah. Cool.
Pretty you know cool I mean? fact. Pretty cool connection. Um, all around. Um, yeah. Hopefully, next time people watch the ball game or they see their uh, see their their grandchild out there with the Louisville Slugger bat out there, they'll think about old Pete Browning. You know, and yeah. uh, and they can think about him t- being a little boy and taking a swig before he took a swing, right? So, and and be thankful that their their uh, son or grandson or daughter is not doing that themselves. <laughs> and also, oh, Bud, Bud Hill Rich decided to skip daddy's work and go uh, talk to old old uh, Louisville Slugger and say, "Hey, man, let me make you a bat." Why don't we skip work tomorrow and see what we can get into historical uh, wise? What do you think? There you go. Well, I don't have to work tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> <summer>. <laughs> yeah man. Yeah. Don Smith says, hey, hello from Arton, Ohio. He's real close to that story that you just did. Oh. They're in, in Ironton, I think you oh, said. Oh, yeah, yeah. Arton is as it's pronounced. So let's see. We got any other comments here before we take off? Uh, um, I have a question. Are, are the Louisville Sluggers the ones who made the bats? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So I got a little confirmation. A billet is basically like the big long pole that um, they they form the bat out of. Okay. Okay. So you know you, you, you get just a big you know pole of wood, <laughs> and then they like you know cut it to form the bat. So. See, it's, uh, Doug Dimery says I visited Walker Smoky Alston at his home in uh, Dartown, Ohio, in about 1969 when he was the manager of the L.A. Dodgers. He mm-hmm. had a great trophy room. Boy, I'd imagine so. Yeah. I'd imagine yeah. so. That would have been pretty cool. Yeah, uh, cool. 1969. And uh, oh, Irish Rev said, cool facts. And, uh, yeah, that was the same comment there. So, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to say about the old Louisville Slugger? Huh? Not much. Um you know, like I said, I, I retired from baseball young. Um, I guess the Reds are my team, but that's about all I got. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you can go there and get a bat. This one actually has my sense upside down. You can go get every, what every good Kentucky boy should have is uh, see Brady Louisville Slugger. On there. He's got his own own name name on a little Slugger there. So we got that when he was just a baby. Cool. But, uh, yeah, he played baseball until up his T ball, and he wanted to quit. And I said, why? Why do you want to quit playing baseball? You just got to tell me why. Yeah. Go, Daddy, it's pretty obvious I'm going to be a track guy. <laughs> and, uh, he's definitely living up to that. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's got state next week, so he's a pretty good pretty good track guy. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll sign off for now, I guess, right? And, That's it, uh, yeah. Uh, check again. us out. Facebook, all that good stuff. Twitter. YouTube. Instagram. YouTube. Absolutely. Anywhere you can find us. We're there somewhere. Check it out and uh, let us know some stories that you'd like us to do. We've got a ton of stuff coming out of Family Tree Nuts over the next few weeks. Uh, we've been working hard on cranking out trees, but we're getting ready to start cranking out a whole bunch of videos there. So, but uh, what do we got next week, Jameson? Uh, I think it was uh, how no um, Shelby, maybe Isaac Shelby, something. Maybe it's a Kentucky person. I'm pre- I'm pretty sure. I don't know what to what to um, figure out the uh, uh, look of the schedule. <laughs> our Fort our Fort our Logan. ironclad schedule. We well, have yeah, Fort Logan. I think it is, isn't it? Fort Logan. Really? Okay. Fort yeah. Logan. All right. Yeah. All right. We got that one covered. I'm yeah, ready for that one. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, all right. Well, I'll take off, buddy, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Hope you guys have a great weekend. And hey, remember, family tree nuts. Let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree. At Family Tree Nuts, we make professional, historic videos all over the country and currently have videos in 25 states and even a few international. Let's face it, nobody wants to read anymore. As a matter of fact, nobody wants to even watch long videos, which is why I'm going to keep this real quick. Moving into the future, how are we going to educate the public on all the historic treasures that are found in every community? We have found the answer. Short, entertaining, and to-the-point videos with lots of shots and views that are relevant to the subject. These videos are shared on social media 
and are the fastest and least expensive way to educate the community on the history of your area. We have experience working with historical organizations as well as city or county tourism departments and chamber of commerces to produce these videos for their use. Our clients are provided with copies of any video produced as well as online links to the videos that they can easily add to their websites. Let us document and produce videos of just a few or all the historic sites in your area. You will find our rates extremely affordable and well below the industry standard for media production. We are passionate about preserving and documenting as many historical sites as we can, and we would love to work with you. For more information, contact me directly at russ at familytreenuts.org or my personal phone at 859-314-1976. And remember, Family Tree Nuts, let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree.